with Scott Marcus. Scott, why don't you tell everybody who you are, what you do for the ISA. We have a special guest because once again, Felicity Wren uh, has decided to go on a trip. Where's my, where's the wig? I, I didn't prep. <laughs> Should have kept that wig. I I'm primarily here to correct all the things that Mike Brennan got wrong last week. Uh, you know, I, I work with the ISA. It's been my pleasure to be with them for, uh, I bet must be coming up on three years pretty soon. I now, think it's actually. at least three years, isn't it? Uh, I think it was around February or so, uh, three years ago. Right. I started, I think, September, the September before you started, and it's about three and a half years for me. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, and I, a business development manager is, is my title, and I am the one that gets a lot of the resources on the, on the page. Uh, the film festivals that have screenwriting contests, the uh, people that teach screenwriting courses, and of course, all the consultants on, on there. That's kind of like my corner of the website, along with the writing gig section. And, and of course, James uh, does the events, and uh, it's all a big team effort. We've, you know, team effort every week. I mean, obviously, everybody watching, you know that Felicity Wren also works for the ISA. Uh, I'm the director of education and outreach. Felicity is our co-head of the ISA development slate. She also helps manage and judge for a whole bunch of our contests that we're going to talk about. As you can tell, we have uh, the business of promoting your work. So we're going to be talking kind of about pretty much everything that the ISA does, how we can help. Um, what specifically Scott does on a daily basis, but I think the main reason we have Scott on, because I technically could have chosen anybody. Oh, <laughs> and you clearly did. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, there was, uh, this was planned well in advance, but um, we wanted to talk about not only what our, our website does, but more importantly, how then that can translate to what writers can do for themselves to help promote, promote their work, how to prepare a pitch, um, you know, what they should expect when they go into a meeting. It's all about that promotional and marketing aspects. It, it's such a gray area and, and, you know, thin line in terms of I am a creative and I'm supposed to write, but then you're also your own business manager and yeah. CEO. Like all the, all the aspects that a, a business contains, you are the head of all of those departments for yeah. yourself. Yeah. And you have to look at yourself that way because you are, you're, you're the head of your own company and uh, nobody else is going to do the work for you. Um, so we're going to be talking a lot about how you can do that with the help of the ISA and a whole bunch of other organizations. We're not the only organization out there. One of the main reasons I love the ISA so much is because we don't really consider ourselves a competitor for anything, even though we have a whole bunch of our own, uh, contests and, you know, our development, uh, evaluations. And I run the story farm, which is consulting and stuff. We love all of our partners, Jen Grisantes of the world, Dan, Danny yeah. Manis and Pilar Alessandra and. Michael Haig and, and uh, Script Anatomy. If you're a TV writer, you should look up Tanya Bhattacharya's uh, uh, LA uh, local uh, TV writing class. It's pretty much the best live TV writing class you can find. So anyway, we promote everybody that, as much as we can. That's a lot of what Scott does. He's reaching out to different organizations to try to, you know, yeah, promote. You know, the, the <laughs> idea is that the, the website, our website, networkisa.org, is a one-stop shop, whatever you could possibly need. Ideally, we will address that. We can help uh, connect you to the people that you're looking for. We can bridge those gaps, uh, make it easy for you to submit to a film festival or easy to find a, a great screenwriting mentor. Right, right. Yeah. But most importantly, the <laughs> only reason we're really here is uh, to, of course, thank our, our uh, sponsor. We got some glare on there, but this is uh, Steel Wines, as usual. She, they, she. <laughs> I think of everyone. She's a fine wine, isn't she? she? <laughs> um, but uh, Steel Wines uh, sends us wine and lets us drink it in front of all these people that watch us. So a huge thank you and shout out to Steel Wines. They are Lake County, California. And um, I, I was reading the label before this, and I kind of want to read the whole thing just because it's so interesting. But I, I won't. Does it read like a Jay Peterman description? <laughs> <laughs> Jay Peterman catalog of Seinfeld. Now, it is interesting because due to its age, and I think the age is referencing to the age of the vineyard, but yields for this Zinfandel are very low and production rarely, if ever, hits a thousand cases per vintage, um, which is really interesting. So it's going to be a unique Zinfandel. We have not had a Zinfandel on All right. uh, our show. Well, you've never had a Scott Marcus on your show. I have not had a Scott so Marcus either. <laughs> so, of course, thank you to Steel Wines. If yes. anybody out there, um, if you are joining us live and uh, you feel like cracking open a bottle of wine, go for it. Uh, if you're not a drinker, that's fine. Water is just as good. 
in some ways. So, so, some could argue better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Cheers. Thank you, Steel Wines. Thank you for joining Scott us. Welcome, Scott, to Wine Wednesday. It's an honor. Mm. <laughs> Ooh, we'll save Molly some, she, as, as per her request here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, who do we have here? Molly. What are you picking up? It's, it's, a, it's a, a medium dry, I yeah. believe. I'm getting like that SNL skit. I'm getting witch, witch's broom. Yeah. <laughs> Werewolf. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, part of me, a big part of me wants to talk a lot about what Scott does behind the scenes outside of the ISA. He's a ghost investigator, paranormal yeah, investigator. Yeah, yeah. He's written a bunch of books about the, the supernatural. I'd love to spend an entire episode talking about that. And really, we should have had you on for a Halloween episode. But um, maybe at Halloween. the end, we'll tell some stories or something. But um, Carol Lynn. Hi, Scotty. Hey, you know Carol, she, Lynn. Carol Lynn, thanks for chiming in. Uh, I used to host a radio show back in Kenosha, Wisconsin. She was one of our very dedicated listeners. I oh always call it. <laughs> Hello, Carol. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, Scott's been, Scott's kind of a natural guest for, for these kind of shows just because you've been doing this for so long. You go to speaking events and yeah. you do a bunch of lectures on the supernatural and you go on, go on podcasts all the time. So this is, this will be fun and easy. Um, let's do a couple little announcements before sure. we start. Uh we have so much going on right now, and we're just, it's kind of crazy that it's only January 31st. Yeah. I, I posted a thing on Instagram on my personal page saying it feels like January the 74th. Yeah. <laughs> this is just feels like some some really long month. My mom chimes in, yummy's in, dad's favorite. Nice. <laughs> um, all right, so we have a contest called Table Read My Screenplay. I'm sure everybody listening and watching has have heard of it. Um, we just got back from the Park City version of Table Read where we brought yeah. a writer out to, uh, to Sundance. Uh, currently open for submission is the Table Read My Screenplay uh, in association with the 22nd Annual Hollywood Pitch Festival. So the winners will be brought out to Los Angeles. They're going to take part in the entire pitch festival with the, the Annual Hollywood Pitch Festival. Uh, it's only $29 to enter right now. So if you guys are looking for contests to apply to, 29 bucks, man. Yeah. It's silly. And you save 10 bucks on your second, third, and fourth entry. So if you have multiple scripts, you're going to pay probably about what you would pay for some of the bigger contests if you submit two or three. Yeah, that's, that's, that's more irons in the fire for yeah. you. And there's no code required. You can just go to networkisa.org and find it, or you can go to tablereadmyscreenplay.com. Uh, Fast Track is our kind of our flagship. I, we, we don't want to call it a contest because it's a fellowship. Um, where for an entire year, two writers are chosen to be our fellows, and we develop their material. Uh, Felicity and I will be working with uh, the writers this coming year weekly, developing not only the winning script that, uh, that goes through the fellowship for each of them, but multiple projects throughout the year. We're going to be promoting those scripts out to town, trying to get in touch with managers and producers yeah. and trying to get their stuff optioned. We've had a lot of success from uh, our past Fast Track fellows. But then, of course, also... We fly the two winners out to Los Angeles and get them a, a week of meetings uh, with a whole bunch of executives and mentors and consultants. And so that's coming up. That final deadline is coming up on February 15th. It's kind of silly for you not to apply if you feel like you've got a really solid script. The competition is a little more, I don't know if I should say fierce, but we take it, you know, I know I won't say that either. The table read my screenplay is a different type of contest, but we, we judge that just as you know competitively as no, the of course, yeah. Um, but Fast Track is kind of like those two writers that we find, they're going to be part of a very important family that we're helping get out around town. Yeah, it's so accurately named Fast Track yeah. because you could be, you know, writing your first draft of your first screenplay or you could be a very seasoned person who who's maybe had something produced or is out there. Uh, wherever you're coming from, you're leaping forward if you win this competition, yeah. this, uh, if you are awarded this fellowship. Yeah. We've had writers that have never had anything optioned. They've never met with an executive of any kind. They've, they don't live in Los Angeles. It's one of their first or second scripts that they've ever written. We've also had most of our fellows, I will say, um, have been doing this a long time. Um, they're ready to take that next step, and that's why we're here and we're trying to do that. So Fast Track's very worthy uh, contest. There you go. We got it. James is on the ball. I said Jane, didn't I? You did. <laughs> James is on the ball. Then my sister is saying, where's Felicity? Who's that guy? I don't know where Felicity is. She's off gallivanting the, the world. She's somewhere. in the sky right now. Yeah, she is flying. She's going to Paris. Yeah. Felicity is, is a traveler. Uh, mm -hmm. She will be back. Ooh, will she be back next next week? I don't know. <laughs> I think she gets in on that Wednesday. So I believe Felicity. You might see a very jet lag, Felicity. <laughs> pretty sure Felicity's going to be joining us next week, but we do have another broadcast next week. Um, okay, let's see. So, and then development evaluation. So we have 
So our fast track fellows are automatically included in, in our development slate, which is a, we have about a hundred riders that we're trying to promote and get out around town. One way to get into the development uh, slate is by applying and submitting your script for consideration. And that's through our development slate evaluation. Um, but even if you are not accepted onto the slate, you're still going to get five pages of really extensive, not just notes, but feedback, suggestions, their development notes. It's not coverage. There's a very big difference between studio coverage and development notes. If you guys want to know what that is, put something in the comments and I'll answer that. Um, but you can go to the ISA website. There's a separate tab that says development slate. There's a whole bunch on there, but how important is feedback? Well, I mean, it's huge. a silly question. I mean, yeah, yeah it's such a, uh, an obvious very, I guess, is the answer. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I, it's just as important as how do you process the feedback, of course. Right, right. But you do need to have, you know, when you are, whether you're a film editor, which is where I came from a, a lot more so than writing, um, you're in your own little echo chamber when it's just you in your room. And to have somebody else's eyes, whether watching something that you've cut together or reading something that you've uh, written, uh, perspective is huge. And actually, I should go back and, and mention, as I'm talking about this, to the table read. The table read my screenplay. Right. right. It is so is different this, yeah. hearing something that you've written uh, get read out loud. Because uh, I remember at one point I, I gave no, I was, had a little mini table read for something I did. And I'm like, okay, well, this will be developed slowly and then turn the page. Oh, no, it just happened now. Well, my pacing was off. Yeah, right. But when you're sitting there writing it, you don't get the feel for that. Right. Because um, sometimes you don't write, most of the time, you don't write a script all in one sitting. And so you're yeah. trying to write in pieces. And sometimes in your head, when you're thinking of the development of the project, you're then, you write this really great sequence. And then you come back a couple of days later and you kind of try to get back into that momentum. And then something like that happens where it's like, yeah. oh yeah, this is a great scene, but you're not necessarily putting the two together. So, but that's a really good point about table read because yes, you should be getting notes. You should be getting feedback. You should be hiring consultants. You should be joining writing uh, groups, et cetera. If you don't have any money, you can, there are peers in just about every city in the country where you can work with them. You can at least find them online, but a table read is a really fun way to ask people to give you feedback. If, if, if you go in knowing that I'm doing a table read, not just as a presentation of look how good my script yeah. is, but instead I know it's not perfect. I want to get people in the audience to give me notes on it. And then you get everybody in the one room. Everybody's technically reading it just once and they're listening. And it's kind of a little event. You get some. <clears throat> yeah. Some, you know, well, you, you had a pretty wine. large scale one for yourself about three years ago. It was about three or four years ago. And I cast it and I got some really great actors and we had a couple of like readings beforehand. And then I got rented a theater and we had like this back little patio party. And I think the whole party in terms of the rental and everything, I think it was like 600 bucks, you know, for sure, the whole sure, rental, sure. I, you know, so I spent a little money on it, but it was so worth it because it was like a party plus yeah. tell me what's wrong with my script. And, yeah, you know. So that's pretty, like when you talk about business development for a writer, yeah, right. that's kind of a way to get people to read your script without reading it. They're coming to a, a bit of a, a party, a, totally. a dinner theater almost totally. type of thing. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what, what came out of that beyond, because not only were you getting notes from the actors during your rehearsals beforehand, but you also gave out a uh, paper for everybody to make notes. Yeah, right. And then they wrote their own notes. And, and then obviously the little kind of cocktail party, if you will, afterwards sure. was a way to kind of mingle with everybody. And they were, t I could hear conversations talking about the script and, and the performances and they, you know, people would come up and talk to me. I learned that there, there were issues with some of the relationships and the dynamics between some of the characters which I was kind of already aware of, but not as aware of, you know, up until that point. Um, but it's also a level of, it's like on that level, it's a, if you're just getting your friends together and listening, forcing them yeah. to listen to your script, it's, it's a, it's a minor level of what the industry does. That's sure. why they have parties. That's mm -hmm. why, that's why this industry is so party heavy yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's a way to promote yourself. Why do you think people try so hard to look good when you're an actor, you try to go to a party and you try to, you know, have arm candy. It sounds terrible. Whether you're a man or a woman, you sure, want to be sure. presentable and you want to be putting the best foot forward so that if you are an actor, you meet a producer and you're impressive and you're together. And you know, there, there are so many ways to promote yourself, especially when you're in this creative industry, not just as a, as an actor, but as a writer too, because if, you go to a party and it's kind of a big party and there's some interesting producers there. They're going to remember you more than they're going to remember your content. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah they're true. going to remember, Oh, this guy is really fun or this girl has a great attitude and she's obviously very smart and intelligent. I'd love to work with her. 
yeah. as opposed to that person had a great idea. Well, I was going to say, and then you probably took away more from your, your experience other than just notes. You probably left an impression on people. You, yeah, right. You maybe became a go-to name that, hey, if I need something written or I've yeah, got right. a certain type of project, I know right. this guy I can do that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. And that's really just one way. I mean, it's, it's and this all started, this conversation just started because we were talking about feedback. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, it is kind of a silly, no-brainer question, how important is feedback? It, it's not even a matter of how important is it. It's essential. You absolutely need it. Yeah. Uh, there are zero you know there's 0 0.001 geniuses in the world who can listen to something and then just nail it their first try yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and even geniuses are spending time practicing and figuring it out so you're not going to be able to do this in your first draft and, and and sell something or get anybody's you know any kind of approval so you need to get the feedback and it doesn't really even matter who it's from as long as you know those people aren't going to bs you yeah. they're not going to pat you on the back and say nice job I, I am surprised, I will say, first off, you're, you're right, that you need it from anybody. You need to just get used to hearing people give you feedback. Uh, but I am surprised at how many people consider themselves very professional writers who, ha who haven't used a consultant. And these are people that it's their job to really know scripts. So why would you right. not? Yeah. You know, if you think your script is ready, uh, and that could be very early in the process, it could be very late. Uh, why would you not? invest in your own invest you're in investing, yourself with you're that. totally investing yourself yes yeah and whether it's a consultant or it's a service like uh any number of script consultation services out there um obviously we get it not everybody has a few thousand dollars to throw away <laughs> i shouldn't say throw away that's not the right term <laughs> to put down on an investment on yourself i get yeah. that you know a lot of us writers are, are struggling and we're just trying to you know pay our bills i get it but there are ways to get feedback without having to pay for it um in terms of our development evaluations. Well, like, and and if you do pay for it, it's not always thousands of dollars either. Definitely if not. If you go to the, if, uh, let's see, on the website, under Screenwriters Toolbox, uh, find a mentor is where the consultants are listed. If anybody's here, looking around. This. So, oh, here dev right. evals, right? Yeah. It's uh, only 100 bucks. Yeah, 99 bucks for the next 20 to sign up. Well, how about that? So there, there With a go. special code. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I totally sprung that on Scott. Yes. <laughs> so, so we are running a promotion right now where if you have not submitted to the development slate for an evaluation, it's only $99, uh, but you have to use, and let's see if, if uh, James is ready for the, the code, <laughs> uh, wine wed one. So wine, W-E-D as in dog, and the number one, wine wed one. You have to go to the development slate portion of the website. It's a, it's a physical thing you can find just by moving your mouse over a tab. Um, Twenty bucks, ninety nine dollars for the first twenty people, so that that code will run out and, and expire after twenty people. So that's under Get Connected on the website, and that is for non Connect members. So Connect members, I believe, reach out, email me at max at networkisa.org if you are a Connect member, and we can. Uh, I don't remember what the price was for Connect members, but um, if you don't know what Connect is, <laughs> what is Connect? Uh, connect is the next tier of the, the membership, you know, because it is free to become a member of the ISA, but you do get some extra perks if you are a Connect member. Uh, and that includes discounts on all of the resources, uh, classes, consultants, and contests, whether they are ones that we are involved with or not. Um, you'll get at least five bucks off, but sometimes a lot more than that mm -hmm. uh, if you are a Connect member. So in a way, especially if you're submitting to contests regularly, yeah, definitely be a Connect it member. Saves. It's going to pay for itself yeah. easily yeah. since it is only uh, 10, 10 bucks a month for Connect yeah, membership. or or 100 for the year if you want to just year. go for the whole year. Yeah. Yeah. But you have access to writing gigs. Um, we're also launching something new called Connect Plus that we can talk about in a second, but I saw some questions come up here. Um, and by the way, everybody, if you have questions about anything, you can ask any question at any time. Pete says, amazing, the errors you find in your script when you read it out loud. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Jason says, are you primarily LA focused or does your network of resources extend into these newer film hub areas like Atlanta? Yeah. So we are definitely not only LA focused. Or, or even film hub focused. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you write an a, amazing script and you live in Saskatoon, you could get flown out to... <laughs> Hollywood for your table read. Right, right. I mean, everybody knows that the film industry is in Los Angeles. Atlanta is booming in terms of that industry right now, not only film, but TV. Um, so 
I would find organizations out in Atlanta as much as you can. In terms of the resources that are that are on our site, it's it's a wide all the range. resources. Yeah, absolutely. Those are yeah all over the place too. Uh, especially if, you know, film festivals are everywhere now. Yeah, there's there's probably a dozen per weekend anywhere somewhere in America, all somewhere in the, the uh, planet. Film festivals, screenwriting contests, uh, mm -hmm. consultants on there. Technically, I think a lot of the consultants don't live in Los Angeles anymore because they. <laughs> And, and a lot of the classes, money. even though they might be headquartered in New York, yeah, they're online classes. So right, right. You know, yeah. you'll do it from home. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, mm -hmm. Joe Ballou says, "Hi, Max. Hello, Joe. Joe is a is a new writer with me for Story Farms. Joe yeah, just, just signed up. Um, so, and we'll talk about Connect Plus and Story Farm in a little bit. But you know, we were talking about promoting promoting ourselves as writers, as creative people. Um, you know what, I'm going to read a little something if you guys don't mind here. So this was feedback that we got from someone who submitted to the development slate and got their five pages of notes. So obviously <laughs> we're choosing this because it's a very nice <laughs> testimonial. Um, but he was very, you know, he's, he's saying very favorable things. Uh, I do understand that feedback is subjective and I try to look at comments with a clear mind with the goal of getting better at my craft. I think that's kind of goal number one. Yeah. Why do you get feedback? It's to improve. It's not to find out if you're doing it right. You know, it's, this is not a presentational industry. It's to find out how can I be better than I was yesterday. But mm -hmm. um, he's saying uh, it can be frustrating to know that this kind of help through the ISA is out there, but isn't always easily accessible, whether it's because of location or, you know, inflated pricing, et cetera. He was, he's referencing a four-day writing workshop. There was a lot of money, and you have to just put down a bunch of money in terms of the travel plans and stuff. Um, yeah. So for the last year, he's relied on consultations like ours to get better because there aren't many other options, especially since he lives in upper Midwest of Minnesota. Um, and he enters a ton of screen, uh, screenwriting competitions. He's not really concerned about winning, but because I know I can get consultation notes. And that's a good that's point. That's fantastic. It's yes. a really good point to make. So all this is to say, as one who doesn't have the financial means for schooling and workshops, it's appreciated that our team... The ISA gives a complete consultation on how I can get better as opposed to a page and a half telling me the script can be better, hmm. uh, which is really, you know, this is obviously a very intelligent person because he wasn't accepted into the development slate for whatever reason. Maybe the script sure. wasn't ready, um, but he's going at it with the best possible approach and, and intent. He, he knows that deep down he's probably talented in some way. But he can always be a little bit better and improve in some way. And I think going into any circumstance, whether it's a pitch meeting or a, a general meeting with a producer or a manager, having some form of humbleness yeah, to you, yeah. knowing that I'm here because, A, you wanted me to be here and I have an opportunity to tell you something that I know is workable and, and hopefully marketable, but also because I can learn from you as well. And if you put that person in that position where oh, he actually or she actually wants to learn from me. Yeah. Then it turns into a conversation. And this is obviously I'm talking about like a live meeting or whatever. That, I mean, that's that, that was my experience. Uh, really amazing how you set that up as if I, we had you know planned this. Ahead. This is not rehearsed. So <laughs> as Max mentioned, my, my background, in addition to you know writing and editing and all that is uh, paranormal research and folklore and history and all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I've been I was at one point in time, I was cast on a reality ghost hunting show. We just went through the sizzle stage. It ended up not going. This is many years ago, but it, um, it opened up the door for me and this one production company that was a, you know, at that time it was a recent Emmy winner. So they were doing good stuff, uh, had began a relationship when the show didn't go. Well, you know, you could have just walked away from it and done nothing, but no, that's a relationship now. Yeah. So right. yeah. I know these it's guys. It's not like the meeting didn't go well. It just, no. They didn't. Hey, they could have cast a lot of other people, but they cast me. So yeah. they must like me enough that they yeah, right. were willing to develop a show with me involved in it. And then, you know, when they couldn't find a home for the show, that's that. But what an asset these people suddenly are, because I have a show idea. Right. Now I can go there to set up a pitch meeting, but also who knows the market better than these people right now? Right, they yeah. just went to market with a show of this type. And so I walked in the door and I asked them, what's the environment like? What's the, what's what the market like? For? Yeah. And so then it, yeah, then it was a conversation. It was almost as if I was interviewing them to find out how I could pitch to them. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and it worked really well. <laughs> yeah. And really, I think it comes, it stems from always being curious, always wanting to learn, always wanting to be better. Um, 
but also just having this innate ability to have a conversation with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes for a live meeting. It's a pitch meeting. If you go to one of these pitch festivals or if you actually have you know, a manager who's sending you out on more than just generals, but people have actually looked at your work, or if you're working with a coach or a consultant or if you're receiving notes, if you keep that open mind of, okay, before I even read the, the five pages of notes, I'm going in knowing the certain things that I'm confident about. And then here are the, another list of things that I'm not really, I think I might not be all that confident about. Yeah. And then seeing what comes out in the notes and then just taking it in and letting it settle and not reacting right away. We get, we do get some people who react immediately and they get defensive. Well, you didn't get this. You didn't get that. That's not really the point. The point yeah. is this reader didn't see that. Now, did the reader just miss it? There's of course a possibility. Of course. Yeah. But it's likely that it could have been clearer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you, you, it's a healthy approach to, um, <laughs> my sister says I'm confident on nothing. <laughs> I don't agree with that, Trina. Um, now, and you know, it's a good point. Like what if, what if you are a very, you know, you know, socially challenged person? What if you don't feel comfortable in crowds? What if you're really uncomfortable sitting down in a meeting? Like how would, it's hard to put yourself in a position if it you're is. not, but <clears throat> what would be the best advice? Well, I, I feel like, I feel like you've got to have the passion for the, the material that you've written. And even if you're not a good salesperson, you have to find a way to be excited about that. And then it's not you in the room, it's your script. And, and so whatever's right. coming out of you, whatever's right. coming through you is this thing that I've created that's so amazing, you can't stop talking about it. Yeah. And, and maybe if you don't feel that, then keep working at it until you do. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and it's, I guess it is, it, it's interesting because a lot of writers do tend to be a little self-deprecating or at least more yeah. self-deprecating than other people. And I think there, there's a level of that where you, it's, it's a healthy, you sure, keeps yeah. you real, it keeps you grounded and otherwise you're just going to go through the clouds. Um, but deep down, you know, that you're good at this. I, I know personally, one of our writers on our slate is probably one of the most talented writers that we have on our slate, but he's, he's very self-deprecating yeah. and he's yeah. not very social, but when you actually get to talk to him, he's extremely intelligent. He's very funny. It's just difficult for him to warm up to people. I, I think, I think you've got to maybe take a, a speech class or something. You, you've got to, that's something that you need to address. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's part of your job, I guess, at that point as a writer. And it's finding, it's, it's pinpointing the things that you, that you know, you're, you're good at, and then finding reasons as to why you're good at them. And then just mm -hmm. reminding that of yourself every day personal affirmations or whatever, to the point of where you don't get cocky, but at least you're like, you know what? I actually am pretty good at this and I can talk about this all day long. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of personal development stuff that comes into marketing yourself, promoting yeah. yourself, being a business, you know, owner of your projects and your, in, uh, you know, your entire career. Um, that's a huge part of it. That's personal and relative to everybody. I think a big part of the industry is that, everything is so relative and it's so opinion based mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's really easy for writers to go, well, they didn't like the script. So I guess yeah. it's not working. Well, I love, it was maybe two, two to three years ago that you and I were at the final draft awards, which are coming up again in just a, a week and a half, oh, about yeah, a week. Your big break contest. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we interviewed the, the president of that contest on the red carpet. And he said, did the best script win? I don't know. Yeah, right. Like, you know, yeah. it's just how it went through the different readers and how the right. scores came in. People, different readers would have judged things differently. So, you know, you both shouldn't get too high on your successes and too low on your perceived totally. failures. Totally. Because it's all just the journey and there's no universal opinion. Yeah. It's all just opinions. There's no universal opinion. And that's actually a good note to make about those really big contests like the Big yeah. Break and Nickel, uh, Blue Cat and Page and Austin, where they get five, 6,000 nickel gets about 9,000 entries that, especially a nickel, the top 100, especially the top 50 scripts, any of those could have been the winner. Sure. So if I were you, if I was a new writer, <clears throat> you're just beginning to either get into the screenwriting world or just feeling comfortable enough to start submitting the contest, I would not go to those huge contests yet because <laughs> it's a good way to get your confidence blown. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I didn't even make it to the quarterfinals. Yeah. Well, there were 8,000 people that it's like playing the lottery, you know? Sure. Um, and I had a script 
not that long, maybe three or four years ago, that I submitted to Nickel and it didn't make the quarterfinals. Fools! I know. <laughs> and I know I'm actually a pretty good writer. I didn't think the script was all that amazing. I probably, I just kind of wanted to test it out and see what happened. I knew I wasn't going to win the thing. But um, it was kind of like, really? I've read some of those other scripts, and, but whatever, <laughs> you can't take it personally. So nonetheless, going back to the contest, find the middle ground script contest, the ones that get 800,000, 1,200 entries, um, you know, table read my screenplay, emergingscreenwriters.com, fast track. They're in the thousand plus, two thousand or more. It's kind of above middle. Um, and, and what I love is within the world of screenplay competitions, there are there, there are the big general ones like that that cover just everything. They're a huge net where everybody can throw their stuff right. into. But there are also so many that are genre specific because it's hard to wrap your mind around how does and, and Carol earlier mentioned. Uh, have, did we see the movie Don't Breathe? Which I did. I oh, actually, coincidentally, yeah. a different. Uh, I was that. That's the first time I was on Jeff York's Page to Screen podcast. Oh right, which is available on the ISA website yeah, as well. Free. All the podcasts on our site, by the way, are free. And that's under the uh, curious. Uh, yeah, curious, curious about, about tab. Yeah, yeah, and that I love that movie. And yes, Stephen Lang was amazing in it. Um, but like, how do you judge a movie like that compared to Forrest Gump? You know, yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's so hard to. And you know what? That's a really good point in terms of promoting yourself and marketing your, yourself as a business, et cetera. If you, you have to know your audience, who am I writing for? Am I a horror writer? Great. That's easy. I know I have a whole horror, horror niche audience that I'm going to be writing mm -hmm. to. Am I a comedy writer? Fine. Or am I a romantic comedy writer? Or am I a 40 year old virgin writer or a yeah. um, Fairly Brothers comedy writer? If you understand who it is you're writing for, then you're going to have a much easier time pitching it to certain people who are going to be wanting that, that, that type of project. And you're going to just come at it with a much more confident approach. Look what this did, what this movie did. And this is the type of movie that I'm trying to write as well. Um, and that's just, you know, knowing the industry and the market. Yeah. But so some of those genre specific contests, yeah. they might be easier for you to get into the quarterfinals or get higher up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you know that you're being read by people that, get your genre also so that's got to be even more uh you know rewarding yeah, right. to you yeah. and, and of course then once you start to get those little accolades even if they're not winning it if they're you know top 10 or top 100 or whatever yeah, right then that's still building your resume as a writer yeah. yeah yeah one of my writers um signed up with me in the story farm the story farm is a weekly consulting and coaching and development service that i provide um but uh she signed up with me about it was a little over a year ago she had never really written a screenplay before. So there was a lot, it was a big learning curve and she had a very big idea. It was, she writes in the horror genre. Um, and uh, we worked through that one script many, many times over probably about seven or eight months, which is a little bit longer than it should technically take, but she was also learning how to do it at the same time. Um, and that script, she ended up submitting it to a horror, uh, oh gosh, I think it was the Breaking Walls thriller oh, contest, yeah. okay. which is like a mid-range, a little, yeah. you know. And that is one that they are on our website. Yeah. I don't know if they're active right now, but they So it's, it's a legit contest, yeah. and they get probably maybe a thousand entries, a little less. You know, it's not a huge contest. Um, and she got in the top ten with that first script she ever wrote. And I told her, I said, you and I both know that the script's not perfect, um, but this is telling you that you're doing something right. Yeah. That you're at least understanding it's, not there's only... There's elements that are there. The story is good enough. Um, we know we have to rewrite it again. We know I have a little more work to do. And she was just, she was so ecstatic, but then she understood that like, okay, this is my first script. It doesn't mean it's going to sell it. And nobody's reached out to her to try to, you know, um, she submitted to a, to a few other contests and it didn't make top 10, you know, so everything's relative, but, mm -hmm. um, point being the receiving the feedback in the no notes is going to, it's going to help you. And that's why this, this uh, testimonial is so good because he chooses the contests that, if he's going to spend $60, he knows he's at least going to get some feedback on it, even yeah. if he's not going to place in something. Um, and that's why Fast Track and Emerging Screenwriters and Table Grand Screenplay, where you can get feedback, even if you don't get in the quarterfinals or semifinals, it's a really inexpensive way to get feedback, as opposed to trying to spend 200 bucks or more to hire a consultant to give you specific notes. Um, so there's mm -hmm. a ridiculous amount of ways that you can get feedback. <laughs> yes. Um, we have a question. That is a good question. I don't know yeah. the answer to it. Is an animated film script identified as such in a certain way, or do readers just figure it out? Um, it's a good question, Pete. And, and if you have a movie that you personally know as the writer, uh, 
is going to be or you want it to be animated, then you could put it on the, the front page saying, here's the title, and you can say an animated feature. Yeah. That way, when they see it, they're like, all right, I'm going to be reading this knowing it's animated. Um, a lot of times when you read a script, as a, a reader who is constantly reading scripts over and over and over again, um, you're going to be able to tell, if you've done it correctly, that this thing is, is not going to be live action. Like one of my yeah. writers wrote this kind of wild fantasy tale about Cupid. Um, he didn't have to tell me it was going to be animated. There was like all these weird heart shaped like monsters and you know, it's not going to be live action. So it kind of depends on the material. Um, but a lot of times you can write as like, especially in today's, uh, visual effects world, you yeah. can pretty much make anything animated or yeah, live yeah. action. Um, it depends on the audience. If you know, you're going to be trying to hit that 12 or 13 or younger market, primarily, you know, female or young boys, um, then yeah, it's probably going to be something that's animated, but you know, and you can just be as simple as under the title animated feature. Yeah. yeah and I, I would imagine like who framed Roger Rabbit, they, they, first time Roger appears like, Oh, this guy's a cartoon, you know? Yeah. Right, right, right. It's going to, yeah. You'll, you'll notate in the action and animated version. If there's of this. a, if there's a mix. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. you got to really, that's all. That was also kind of a director's movie. Um, who, who directed Zemeckis, movie? right? Not sure. My, my favorite little anecdote about that movie was that Charles Fleischer, who is the voice of Roger Rabbit, he would, he's a comedian and he would get into character. He would, he like made, he saw the character sketches and then he made his own big red pants and some like this homemade, terrible looking, but just to, when he went into voice, he would love that. dress up um, really apparently kind of sloppy looking, but he it got him there. And then he would go to lunch at the, the, the studio commissary yeah. still in costume. And people who didn't quite know that it was a mixed media type of thing thought that movie's going to be terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's got wardrobe on yeah. that? <laughs> That's funny. Um, let's see. What else can we hit? I mean, there, there are so many elements. I guess we can talk about the pitch process. Sure. Um, because pitching pitching is interesting. Um, what would if you had to nail it down to one thing? And let's let we'll kind of paint the picture. You have you have a pitch meeting that you know you're going to have less than a half an hour. Mm -hmm. And they know about the project. You, they haven't really read it. It's kind of a general meeting. They're interested in the idea and, and et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you approach that? So what I, where I've had actual success is with, in, in the world of television, not screenplay, not, not features. So I think it could probably apply to both, but maybe this is more pointed to TV. Uh, locate where your project like every element of it that is building on something else something else that's been successful but this is why our show is different okay and um i have my the first screenplay i ever wrote which back when we were at columbia college it was a mafia movie and i remember the the guy that was kind of our <laughs> caretaker or whatever for uh, the semester in la program oh, right yeah uh, he said you know okay this is a mafia movie. There's other mafia movies out there. Why is this one different? I'm like, oh. I just wasn't ready to answer that for one. Yeah. But in time, that made me start to think about why is it different? Right. Yeah. What, what's what am I bringing new to it? And uh, and then just less than a well, about a year ago, I guess I was invited to pitch a show to uh, to a company, and and I just I went beat by beat about what I'm doing in this format that's existed for a while. What am I doing that's different that we no one's seen before? And I really focused and highlighted on the different, the different, the better. It, yes. And, and it's, that's a really good point. At the same time, you have to have a little bit of a balance though, mm -hmm. because the people listening they're they're technically going to be making those business decisions like, okay, yes, I can see this is probably like this or the, the, this or this, or they may secretly know that they have something like that on their slate. Sure. Um, so it, I, I would say it, it would have to be a nice 50, 50 balance of, it's going to be like this and these other projects, but it's different because here's the story. Sure. And, and so you're getting into the, here's what, what it is. I, I, you know, working through this industry and a whole bunch of different jobs from distribution to production companies to, you know, school for screenwriters, et cetera. Um, I, I heard so many times uh, like a, the basic question about an idea or about a movie or about a TV show, the basic question of what is it? Yeah. And when I was younger, it would really frustrate me. Like, what do you mean? What is it? I don't know how to answer that question. And 
it, it boils down to the, the pr producer or whoever it is that's considering the project. They need to understand immediately, what do we have? Is it, is it a basic romantic comedy with this type of recurring moment or hook? What's the middle of the movie? What's the, what's the experience the audience is going to have for about an hour and five minutes or so in the middle of it all? As opposed to, here's a setup to a cool idea. Yeah. We don't ever want anybody that we're talking to, whether it's your mom or a producer, to go, then what? Sure. They, they want to be able to help fill that in. So that if you say it's a story about a lawyer who is physically unable to uh, tell the truth for 24 hours, um, you know, et cetera, you want the producer to be like, okay, I can see the middle of that movie. I sure. can see that he's this and this. And then the producer would go, so maybe like his, he's like a deadbeat dad and his son like made a wish that he can never tell a lie. And now he's got 24 hours and, and then you can come back with, yeah, right. Yeah. And he, it's the, during the biggest case of his career. Yeah, and sure. And it all yeah. takes place and you're building the story together with the producer. Um, but if you only focus on the setup of the idea in a mm -hmm. pitch, they're, they're not going to know what to do with it. They're like, well, okay, what is that? You know, and especially if you're like trying to set up some giant science fiction, crazy epic story in space, <laughs> it's hard to fill that stuff in. Sure, you know, sure. They, you want an idea where they can be like, oh, I can start seeing what's going to happen next, as opposed to waiting for you to tell them what's going to happen next. That's yeah, that's yeah. like a nightmare. It's like, I, anytime I think of a nightmare, it, it's like a, a fumbled football that's like rolling away from you. Just out of you, reach. <laughs> it's, a, oh, it's, it's a horrible feeling when you're sitting in a meeting and the producer is like, I don't get it. Or it's like that moment in Big mm -hmm. when Tom Hanks, like he raises his hand in that meeting. And yeah. the, the, the guy is pitching like yeah. a skyscraper <laughs> and the, Tom Hanks goes, I don't get it. You know, <laughs> we don't want that. We want, we want people to get your idea immediately. And it comes from the middle of your story. What is the hook? What is the experience going to be? It's Frodo bringing a ring to a mountain to try to destroy it. And, or Frodo, you would say it's a tiny little hobbit with sure. a bunch of other bigger... Don't pitch Lord of the Rings. It's a horrible example, uh, but you know, and you can, but you can test yourself. Like, but yeah, I mean, you talk about you mentioned that he's the, this little guy. Yeah. So okay, obviously he's got physical limitations that will be just consistently getting in his right. way. So and there's you're... flaws and personal traits you throw in there. Mm -hmm. I could talk about pitching all day and all night, but and that's really just the actual act of pitching something. Yeah, there's a whole other process of needing to prepare to go into a pitch. I remember we, during our fast track fellowship, Felicity and I take our writers around town and we take them to all these meetings and uh, they're, they're business meetings slash generals. It's really just kind of making a new yeah. contact. And um, both of our writers that we took to CAA, we were waiting in this, in, in the waiting room. If you've never been in the CAA offices, it's like sitting in, an updated version of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Like yeah. <laughs> it's, it's so contemporary. It's, it's intimidating. And um, by design, totally by yeah. design. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so the writer, we, the writers and I were sitting there waiting for the meetings and um, they both knew that they weren't going to, they're not going to get an agent today. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're going <laughs> to, they're, they're going to get inside. these people. Yeah. But one of them said, if nothing else, I know where to go when I go to CAA next time. Like when you walk there into you the go. doors of CAA, you're like, oh, yeah. it's like you have to flag down your sure. like a, a front desk person. Like, yeah. what, 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 I'm nobody. What do I do? You don't want that feeling because that's killing you when you're about to go into a meeting. Yeah. So yeah. little experiences like that, you have to be aware. You can of. walk in with some confidence next time. So if you've never been to you know Paradigm or if you've never been to a major agency, try to do the research. What does the office look like? Where do I go? Who do I talk to? Um, just so that it's not killing you because you should be prepared for the meeting itself and not completely intimidated by the experience. Um, so it's, yeah. preparation is huge. Yeah. Uh, James has a question. Uh, nice one. When pitching, is there value in stating that my film is this meets, meets this, or does that come across as unoriginal? Well, what do you think? I think it's, a, I think it's great to, to say it's this meets this because it, people are familiar with these movies that you're going to be using. You're going to be using successful movies also. You're not going to be pulling two different bizarre, mm -hmm. obscure ones that were unsuccessful because you're already going to, so you're already associating your project with two things that one made hundreds of millions and won Oscars. Totally. And, but then also the, it's a shorthand that we can all share. Uh, and that, that just jumps over so much setting up. Right, 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 right. It's a really tricky thing though, 
because I do agree that yes, it, it helps to go, it's Jaws meets Nightmare on Elm Street or something, you know, it, but. Shark, <laughs> shark knives. But <laughs> that, <laughs> shark knives. <laughs> but, but that time of combination yeah. makes, makes sense in, in, in an entertaining sort of way. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. look what the reaction was when I said that. Like sure. you were laughing, ha ha, this is kind of funny. So if you know you have a comedy, you can be like, ah, maybe I'll throw a really weird this meets this there sure. just to set tone. You're not really telling them that it's going to be these two movies converging. No, no, no. And you would say maybe like it's the tone of this movie mm -hmm. or the suspense levels of this movie yeah. and then the world similar to this movie. Yeah. But um, you want to be very careful with that. Don't just throw it around because sometimes, well, the executives you're meeting hear this shit all day long, five yeah. days a week. Mm -hmm. They take literally 30 meetings or more, either on the phone or in person, all day, every day. And they're sometimes exhausted when you come and you're talking to them. So if you throw some basic this meets this out and then have really nothing to follow that with, they're going to be like, where's my lunch? Yeah. Like this, you know? Well, my favorite story I know firsthand from a high concept pitch that ended up yielding a big blockbuster movie, a franchise, uh, a guy I used to, I was the first intern for Revolution Studios uh, back when we were rooming together in college. Yeah, this was 2001, yeah. 2002. Yeah. Um, a guy came in for a meeting, uh, pitched whatever he was going to pitch. It didn't go well. The executive was walking this guy uh, back out to the reception desk. And he said, well, what about this? Again, time frame, 2001, 2002. Uh, what if Fred Durst from Limp Bizkit was a secret agent? And that was the pitch. Yeah. And that became the movie Triple X. Yes. <laughs> yes. But look what he did, though. He, 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 he brought two things that were familiar. He didn't just use two movies. No. Familiar. Yeah. No. It was this type of character meets this sort of situation. And I think that's really important to note, the yeah. situation. Because look what happens with that. When, when you see sequels for movies, you have a repeatable situation that you can, you can enjoy over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And with Triple X, you know you're going to have that type of character just being a badass all it's over like the place. It's like extreme sports, action. Right. It's, it's the, a younger, Why do you more... think Fast and Furious has nine oh movies or whatever? Yeah, People yeah. People know what yeah. they're going to see. Same director. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they, so they know what they're going to see. We have Alexa in the other room talking to us because <laughs> evidently... <laughs> We have some Amazon thing. I guess Alexa thinks we're talking to her. That was like a weird ghost moment. Like, it was. there's a woman in the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was weird. Uh, Julia Wes Wesley, my, my niece, Matt Fatal, Diane Lansing, confidence for the next time. You know, there's always a next time. I think it's, you know, it's a good point yeah. to make. There's always going to be a next time. Even if you completely flop in a meeting, who knows, maybe that executive is going to be telling that story to all of his buddies at the bar and like, you will not yeah, believe yeah, the story. Yeah, yeah. They're going to remember the story. They're not always going to remember you unless you're a complete and utter well, idiot. This is a good good one, too, from from Wadsworth, Illinois, uh, Patrick Reed Johnson, who uh, went on to, he, he directed, um, it was Baby's Day Out and Spaced Invaders, and he wrote Dragonheart. He was young and in Hollywood, very enthusiastic writer. And steel wines, thank you. <laughs> steel wines after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he didn't know how to pitch. And somehow he got a meeting over at Paramount. And what he did is he went was in. Was he living in, in Illinois at the time? I don't know. I don't thank know. you, steel wines. Yeah. <laughs> he went in and his pitch was he acted the movie out. And he oh, did it with right. such like gusto, which don't do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not what you should do. Yeah. But he left an impression. He more than left an, imp an impression. He just entertained the hell out of the executive. So first off, he, he did care a lot about the movie, the story he had, uh, the, the screenplay. Uh, so you got to love that. Uh, he's like, come next door. And he showed him around to the other executives. Like, look at this buffoon. <laughs> you know? Right. Yes. Right. And in that same day, they were actually like, we got to show Sherry. Right. And so he went to Sherry Lansing's office. Oh, my God. And he didn't sell the pitch or anything, but... Paramount, literally every executive at Paramount knew right. of this guy at yeah. that point. Yeah. And yeah, you left the mark. He didn't sell anything, but he eventually became a working writer director. Right. right. In any way you can be memorable without not being without being crazy. <laughs> and this is a fine line. And I line. think he was very fine line. I think yeah, he was right that on that line. Fine line. Um, it's it's so relative and difficult. Um, 
Samantha, I'll, I'll get to that question in a, in a second. I actually answer, ask, answer the, tried to answer that in a newsletter email I sent out um, earlier this week to my story farm list. But um, pitching is so difficult in terms of how do you approach it? And it's always going to be relative to the person you're pitching and the situation of the pitch. Like if you, if you go into, if the meeting is scheduled and someone else scheduled it for you and the person agreed to meet you without reading any yeah. of your material, that's not a pitch meeting. Like don't go in thinking that's a pitch meeting. It's a get to know you. Yeah. Who is this person? Can I sit in a room with you for 15 minutes? Sure. Don't just open up and start throwing crap at them because mm -hmm. they're like, wait a minute, why did, what did I agree to? You know, yeah. those people are probably taking time out of their lunch to, to meet with a new <clears throat> writer that they might like. That's mm -hmm. really all they're thinking. If they've read the script and they said, this isn't for me, but we do have some projects that we have on our slate. Could you come in and we'll talk about them? Sure. That's going to be some form of a pitch meeting because they're going to pitch you the, the idea that they have. And then they're going to want you to come back with, here's how I would do it. Those are tough because you have yeah. zero preparation. So you have to be kind of on your toes. Um, the, the general meeting is kind of what I just mentioned in terms of let's just meet somebody. A pitch meeting could be set up by one of your agents or a manager and saying, hey, this writer has this project that I think is going to be good for you guys because you have this type of assignment. Most of the work a writer gets is through assignment. Yeah. yeah Rarely, yeah, yeah. if ever, are you just going to outright sell a script. It happens sometimes, um, but usually your best script is going to get you work in some other fashion because the studio has this project that they need a young writer that they don't want to spend a million dollars on. They can spend WGA minimum. You make $120,000 maybe, um, but you have to write it in four weeks or, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There, there are so many different parameters. It's hard to just kind of go, here's the universal answer to everything. You know, um, I'm rambling at this point, but let's, we can get to Samantha's uh, uh, question. How do you know when your script is ready to query? Well, I mean, we were talking so much about feedback and, and going through consultants and also uh, film festivals. I, I think once you start to place regularly, at, at, you know, more than quarterfinals, yeah. uh, that's definitely up there. And also, you know, the, I don't know when, when she's saying query, is she meaning cold calling or that's the, that's the tough word in that, that question's meant to. So yeah. query in the literary novel world, query until your heart's content. Yeah. Those agencies are used to that. They may not read it, but they accept those queries. They'll take some unsolicited uh, material unsolicited queries more often than entertainment companies. Mm -hmm. A lot of times movie companies or film TV companies do not want random queries be, with a pitch and an idea and everything because you later could say, hey, you made this movie and it's a yeah. lot like mine yeah. and suddenly they're in a lawsuit. They want a lawsuit less than you want one. So that's the main reason why unsolicited material is rarely accepted in town. Managers, though, you can reach out to managers and ask them. Oh, there you go. Submitting for organization. Great. So managers, you can email them. I would not email them right out. Sorry, guys, she's laughing. Um, <laughs> I would not reach out right away with my script and here's the pitch. It would ask the manager, I see you have, because I looked on IMDb, you have, you know, 15 clients, but you don't have a 20-year-old African-American girl on your roster. Mm. Would you consider, you know, me? or you, you know, whatever little, you know, void you think they might want to fill. You don't have a comedy. Would you writer. try that? At the <laughs> <laughs> they can't see it through the email. Yeah, right. They don't know, they don't know what I look like. Um, no, I would not try that. Okay. <laughs> It'd be very interesting in general. <laughs> Can you imagine? I'd have to, that's a whole like Cyrano de Bergerac movie right there. <laughs> you have to go take this meeting. Um, but uh, we'll get to very Diane's true, note. Yeah. So, when is it ready? You know, like the one thing I was saying in my newsletter email is that there are so many different levels of readiness in terms yeah. of ready to submit to a manager. You really want to make sure that you have more than just one script. They're not going to manage you or rep you based on one script. They're going to say, this is pretty good. If they agree to read it, what else do you have? And you want to be able to be ready for with four or five other scripts that you can say, this was, it won this contest. It was a finalist here. I've been, you know, working with Michael Hegg for the past two years, or, uh, you know, I'm a story farm writer for the last year and a half, or it, it, you want to be able to show your accolades. It's just like a resume. You want to make sure that they understand the type of writer they're getting 
that you're taking it seriously. You're taking it seriously. You've been doing this for a long time. Um, by a long time, I don't mean it has to be a decade. You've been, you've been focused on this for a year or two or three.